We're going to talk to the brand new dean now of the Medical College of Georgia at Augusta University. He's been there a while. Now he is in charge at MCG at AU. He is Dr. David Hess. Dr. Hess, thank you for being here. Congratulations on the job. Thank you, Brad. And thanks for having me here. Well, you're more than welcome anytime. Uh, how do you like it so far? Are things going well? I love it. It's yeah. the best job in the world. Are you going to get rid of anything that we might notice or add anything that we might notice? Um, Any headline making things in the works? Well, um, you know, some of those things are still under development, but, um, you know, we're doing a, a, a search for the new cancer center director, mm -hmm. so that's kind of exciting. We're searching for a number of new chairs, uh, new department chairs. For example, my old chair in neurology, we're doing a search there. So a lot's going on with our campuses. You know, we have uh, a number of regional campuses. We're the eighth largest medical school in the country and the 13th oldest, and so we have campuses all throughout Georgia. We're really statewide, even though our headquarters are here in Augusta. You've got the size. How do we get the prestige? How do we get MCG rattled off the top of someone's mind when they think best schools in the country, which we already know. How do we get them to know? Right. Well, that, that's mostly driven by rankings, which are heavily weighted toward NIH funding. So the idea is to get in the top 50 NIH funding. So mm -hmm. we're presently about 70. So I think the next step is to get into the 60s. And that's by rec you know, recruiting and retaining great researchers. Do we know anybody at the National Institutes of Health? Do we have any pull up there? Yeah, we do. We all, <laughs> we all serve on study sections, but it's very competitive, as you know. Yeah. Uh, most of the uh, funding is at the 8th you know, to 15th percentile, which means you have to be in the top 15% you know, usually to get funded. Let's so go. it's very competitive. It is, it is. And I know that you'll be in the top 20, 25 at least soon. I was looking at a list today. It's heavy Ivy League. I know we can slip in there. What about the Cancer Center and its ongoing quest to get National Cancer Institute designation so that we can be an right. NCI-designated cancer center? Any closer to that? And is that what you want out of the new guy or, or lady? Well, we do. The timeline we're not sure of. I think it's unrealistic to say we're going to be there in three years or five years or even seven years. Um, it's a very high bar to get. You basically have to displace somebody to become an NCI designated cancer center. Mm -hmm. So I think our new cancer center director who we're searching for now, that will be uh, something we'll ask them to look at and do, but uh, exactly how many years I, I can't say. The important thing is to be on the right trajectory. What happened to Dr. Khalif? He was a frequent guest on the Means Report and seemed like he had y'all on the right track. Well, he was a great researcher, um, but for whatever reasons, you know, things don't always work out, but he was a great researcher from NCI. Uh, but now we're going to go in a little different direction. We, speaking of research, have been following mm -hmm. your efforts on the front of stroke and uh, mm -hmm. not only helping to try to prevent stroke, but you know, by spotting it early, uh, but by treating those who have had a stroke. Uh, how is your research going there mm -hmm. and, and will it stop now that you have so many other things to do? No, Dr. Keel assured me I could still do some research. So Good. part of my effort is still submitting NIH grants and trying to do research. We just had a study published in the journal Lancet Neurology about our big stem cell trial. Mm -hmm. We just completed the largest stem cell trial actually in the world in stroke. And it was named the master's trial of all things. Um, so these were uh, a, a type of stem cell you give uh, through the veins. We give them intravenously. And the stem cells are actually harvested from someone's bone marrow. So actually we take it from their hip and we expand it. We work with a company called Athersis up in Cleveland. So mm -hmm. that's a good example of a medical school pharmaceutical company partnership. Did it prevent someone from having a stroke or did it diminish the uh, effects? It was mostly looking for re recovering. It was, it was promoting recovery. So when we looked at people, it seemed to promote recovery out to a year, not at 90 days. And it seemed to work especially well in people who were treated in a certain time window of 18 to 36 hours or 24 to 36 hours. So we're going to do two more trials. One's actually going on in Japan and one will be starting here in North America uh, hopefully in the fall of this year. So I know a lot of stroke patients and their families' ears probably perked up when you talked about mm -hmm. that. Uh, so is it possible right now for someone who has a stroke who gets to you within that window and says, please give me the stem cells quickly? Well, this is part of a clinical trial. The FDA would not let us do that. We mm -hmm. have an IND, and so you have to be in a clinical trial and you have to meet certain criteria. Uh, what about the effort to prevent strokes? Any, any gains on that front, uh, whether it's through encouraging yep. lifestyle changes or medicine we can take? Yeah, you ask a great question, and we are in the stroke belt. We have the highest incidence and prevalence of stroke in the, in the country and some in the world, and it's particularly the coastal plain of Georgia and South Carolina, particularly bad as you get to the coast and below I-16. So what we know uh, about stroke is the, the best way to prevent it is to control your blood pressure. 
Uh, and we have a lot of uncontrolled blood pressure, particularly in the southeast. The other thing you can do is exercise. Exercise is probably the best thing you can do after controlling your blood pressure. So as what's happened is people um, uh, adopt a sedentary lifestyle, you know, video games. We're not out in the field. We're not working. Uh, we're a more sedentary society, and that actually increases your stroke risk, your heart attack risk, everything bad, even your cancer risk is increased if you're sedentary. So being a couch potato is like the new smoking, and we've got to get people up and get them to exercise. Are you talking about a certain age group? Can young people, do young people need to be worried? Those are the people who play the video games in large part. It's true. Well, young people need to worry, but actually as you get older, the, the rate of exercise drops because you have joint problems and, and uh, hard to get out. You may have arthritic conditions that prevent you from exercising. But it is at all range, and it tends to be uh, higher socioeconomic classes tend to exercise. So we worry about the people in the lower classes, socioeconomic class, who don't have a job that don't exercise, and they're at really increased risk. Uh, what about some sort of, and I know you probably hate this question, pill we can take that would just bust those clots, either if they exist, or prevent the clots from forming, and really help ward off stroke? Is that out there? Well, that's not out there, but something close to it. We, we're trying to develop exercise in a box. Yeah. Because we know not everybody's going to exercise. So actually, if you put a blood pressure cuff up on your leg or arm, blow it up for five minutes to your hand tingles, release it, do that four cycles. We call that remote conditioning, and we think it's equivalent to exercise. So in the future, you could be in your easy chair. We'd prefer you to exercise, but if you can't, you go in your easy chair, push a button, and this cuff will blow up, repeatedly deflate, and that may give you the exercise effect. Okay, wait a second. Is that on the market now? Because that sounds highly appealing. Um, well, not yet. We have an IDE with the FDA, though, to eventually get it on the market. We have to show that it works first. It right. works, in, works in mice very well. We know it's going to work. How far out till we can buy the box, put it on, and just chill yet exercise? Well, if you go to Canada, you can get it. Right. Uh, or if you go to China, you can get it. But you can't quite get it in this country yet. What about the effort, and I love this part of what you are doing over there because you talk about something that's gotten worldwide attention, your efforts via reach. That is to go to areas where people don't necessarily have access to medical care, especially stroke patients, Correct. and serve them. Tell us how things are going with reach. Right. So reach is a, a remote evaluation of stroke. It's basically telemedicine, and it's a way to connect us anywhere we are. Uh, I could even log on here if I had a computer and, and internet access, which I'm sure I have here. Mm -hmm. And I could literally connect to 30 hospitals that we cover in Georgia and South Carolina. So we tend to cover very, very small hospitals where there's no neurologists. And via reach, we can give TPA to stroke patients. And importantly now, we can fly them here to a comprehensive stroke center and pull the clot out. Yes, about pulling the clot out. We can pull the clot out mechanically, mm -hmm. and that's been shown to work. The trouble is you can only pull the clot out in Georgia in Atlanta and Augusta. So our big challenge now is to identify the patients, get the helicopter out them, fly them up here because we only have a few hours, and then we take the clot out here at Augusta University Medical Center. We're a comprehensive stroke center, and the only ones in Georgia are in Atlanta, where there's three or four, and in Augusta. So by using the REACH technology, is it physician talking to physician and then you go from there or can the patient get in front of that camera and, and, and be diagnosed online? Right. Both. So we, we actually go to the patient and the family who's there. So they're usually lying on a stretcher. We ask them how they're doing. The physician may be busy doing other things. We often have a nurse and then we have the family. So we talk to the family to find out when the stroke started because many stroke patients can't speak and are not aware of when it started. And we have to know when it started to know how much time we have. Uh, so that's why it's important to talk to the family and the patient. So we do that, talk to the doctor, give them TPA or not, and then we helicopter them up here as fast as we can get them up. Is there a big connection between stroke and dementia? Yes, there is. In fact, probably 30 to 50 percent of dementia is caused by small strokes. Mm. Uh, and strokes that we might not know we've had? Exactly, silent strokes. As we get older, we have silent strokes we, we're not even aware we have. They don't affect your ability to move or it may be speak, but they affect your ability to remember and think. So we call that vascular dementia, which is a growing worldwide problem. What should one do to make sure that's not happening, or can you even detect a silent stroke? It's hard to detect. We can detect it by doing some MRI imaging, some imaging, by doing bedside exams, bedside uh, cognitive testing. Uh, and so that's really important. And then the best thing to do, again, treat your blood pressure and exercise. Because exercise is probably the most effective way to reduce your risk of dementia. Probably my last question. Have you all learned anything 
when it comes to forestalling dementia, buying families and patients maybe an extra year or two before it really sets in? Well, there's no drug that can do that, unfortunately. All these drugs that we thought would work by targeting amyloid and this tau protein have not been effective so far. So as you know, the NIH is very interested in that. Obama signed a piece of legislation, now there's increased funding to do this. But that's, that's everybody's search now. How do you forestall dementia? I personally think exercise is the way to forestall it. Yeah. And maybe even use remote conditioning if you can't you know, exercise yourself, you know, put this device on. Well, we're going to continue to root for the approval of the remote conditioning, the exercise in a box. And uh, we appreciate all of your efforts, Dr. Hess, and your time today for sure. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you uh, having us. Anytime, anytime. Dr. David Hess, brand new dean of the Medical College of Georgia at Augusta University, continuing his research, continuing to help all of us.